welcome Chief Executive Officer of the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change and daughter of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Pernice A. King. Good evening, I am honored to join with each of you in the AJC community of conscience as we reflect upon the legacy of President Abraham Lincoln, President Harry Truman, and now Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. No one who is here today and deny the fact that we are living in very polarizing times, where hateful and violent rhetoric and action are a constant reality. Yet as we, the community of conscience, gather together in the city that my father delivered his iconic I Have a Dream speech from the steps of that Lincoln Memorial, <laughs> Almost 56 years ago, I have been tasked to recall some of the words he spoke on that day to those fighting for freedom and justice amidst a climate of hatred and evil. He said, in the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. Some four years later, in 1967, my father delivered another message entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? During his last SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference convention. In that message, he said the following, I'm concerned about a better world. I'm concerned about justice. I'm concerned about brotherhood. I'm concerned about truth. And when the one is concerned about that, he can never advocate violence. For through violence, you may murder a murderer, but you can't murder murder. Through violence, you may murder a liar, but you can't establish truth. Through violence, you may murder a hater, but you can't murder hate through violence. Darkness cannot put out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. He continued, and I say to you, I have decided to stick with love, for I know that love is ultimately the only answer to mankind's problems. And I'm gonna talk about it everywhere I go. I know it isn't popular to talk about it in some circles today. And I'm not talking about emotional bosh when I talk about love. I'm talking about a strong, demanding love. For I've seen too much hate on the face of too many Klansmen and too many white citizens counselors in the South to want to hate myself. Because every time I see it, I know it does something to their faces and their personalities. And I say to myself that hate is too great a burden to bear. I have decided to love. And the beautiful thing is we aren't moving wrong when we do it because John was right, God is love. He who hates does not know God, but he who loves has the key that unlocks the door to the meaning of ultimate reality. Although these words 
were spoken some 56 and 52 years ago. They still resonate today. My father's legacy is that of love. As leader of the modern civil rights movement, he showed us that love is not passive. It does act in the face of violence, hate, and brutality. It acts with courage to stand up with truth and the, built, the ability to take hits, but with a refusal to inflict harm. It was love that gave him and those who followed him the strength to resist falling prey to hatred and bitterness and rage toward the evildoer. He often reminded people that love compels you to not only refuse to hit or hurt your opponent, but to refuse to hate your opponent as well. My father made love a conscious choice every day, no matter what he was faced with. Instead of choosing to respond from his emotional instincts, he chose to respond from his higher self. That is why he could say, we must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. May we all be reminded that love is still the only answer as we seek to create a more just, equitable, humane, and peaceful world today. We need leaders who, like my father, will let love fuel their work. We need leaders who choose love as the pathway, even when others say and do all manner of evil. In the days ahead, if we're going to change the climate of our times, then it is, it is incumbent upon us to arm ourselves with this weapon of love, which is the only power that can expose and drive out evil, bitterness, bigotry, anti-Semitism, and hate. When we show up in any environment, especially where there's hatred and anti-Semitism and bigotry and violence and bitterness, we should be prepared to show up with love, where the tenor and tone of our words are that of truth, ki kindness, and compassion. We must recognize as my father did, that love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Love is the only beacon capable of disarming the hearts and creating the opportunity for truthful dialogue. Through the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change, we educate and train people in the precepts and strategies of nonviolence used by my father, of which unconditional love is at the core. There are two very important tenets that are critical in any struggle to combat hate and violence. In the first place, it is always critical to direct all aggression toward the evil and injustice, and not the person doing the evil or injustice. You direct love and conciliation toward the person. We say that nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice and evil and not the people doing the injustice or evil. It attacks forces of evil and not the people doing the evil. The reason for this is because in the second place, the goal is to win the adversary, the evildoer or the hateful person over and not to win over them. In this vein, we teach that nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. If we focus negative energy toward the person, then all we get is more negative energy and nothing changes. We just end up with more negative, more hate, and more violence. As my mom used to say though, somebody has to cut off the chain of violence. Nonviolence and love are the only way to do this and bring about a true transformation. Nonviolence as espoused by my father can help to bring about both external legislative and the internal heart change. Dr. King taught us 
that the power of coalitions to bring about these kinds of changes are powerful. We can change our current climate of hate and violence if we work as a coalition of conscience to commit to work in a synergistic fashion to change both the internal and the external. Through religion and education, we work to change the internal attitudes. Through the legislative process, we work on policy and laws to curtail the external effects of those bad internal attitudes. In the final analysis, if hate, violence, bigotry, bitterness, anti-Semitism are to be defeated in our world, we must open up channels of constructive communication and move in the direction of dignified dialogue where we talk with each other rather than damnifying dialogue where we talk at each other. In 1962, my father spoke at Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa, and he said, I am convinced that men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. And they don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other. And they don't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. In closing, I charge this community of conscience to move forward in the days ahead, to engage in these dignified dialogues, leading with love. This is our hope, and this is our faith for the future. And in the words of my father, again 56 years ago, from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, he said, with this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation and world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood, and I add sisterhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is to become a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last.